afternoon, everyone. And uh, I would like to talk about the uh, Regional Environmental Center. Uh, the, we call it CARIC in Central Asia. Uh, we have uh, been working in the region for the last 20 years. And uh, I don't want to stop, I don't want to take much time about the organization itself, rather that I would like to use these seven minutes on talking about the Nexus approach. We are trying to uh, introduce into the region and this experience we are using from EU uh, and our project, the Nexus, the water, energy and food security experience is being supported by EU uh, in Central Asia. So, uh, in brief, we call we call our organization CARIC, and we work in the five Central Asian countries: uh, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan. And we also have a country office in Afghanistan, so we also do work in Afghanistan. Depending on the availability of projects, uh, so uh, currently, although our office in Afghanistan is uh, currently not working on a full-fledged basis, but still uh, there are some experiences that I will be uh, sharing uh, with you at a later stage. And next slide is here I would like to talk about um, water security, which is currently becoming a precondition of peace and development in the region. Hence the Nexus dialogue in these Central Asia region is built around water issues. Apart from rapid population growth, you can see the indicators from the left side of this table. And on the right, you can see the trends. As an example, I can highlight uh, that agriculture, you can see this uh, fourth trend. Agriculture is consuming over 90% of drinking water in the region. So undoubtedly, countries are making efforts to develop a green, sustainable economy, introduce resource efficiency practices and change management systems. And all countries in the region are undergoing large scale reforms when systems of governance, uh, functions and powers of uh, state bodies to, uh, and accordingly the systems produce uh, they, they undergo some changes and specialized departments are being created which are empowered to coordinate and prepare joint projects. Intersectoral working groups, uh, councils with rep representatives of business, civil society, academia and so forth. So the region has, after the implementation of Nexus 1 approach and now we are currently uh, implementing Nexus 2, phase 2, the uh, region already has an understanding of uh, this approach and the need for rational use of natural resources, prerequisites for applying the national, uh, the Nexus approach in Central Asia. This, the, our second phase is called um, Fostering Water, Energy and Food Security Nexus and multi-sector investment. And uh, our efforts in Central Asia to find solutions toward this water and energy and food security nexus. So what is the current situation in the region? Uh, this slide shortly describes the current mood of sector works and prove the need to promote a multi-sectoral collaboration. In order to countries to be ready to introduce Nexus approach, to plan and budget uh, investment projects, we need to demonstrate its effect and uh, the benefit of stakeholders. To build these evidence, uh, the EU supported Nexus dialogue project in Central Asia started implementation of four demo projects in, uh, in the region. So looking at the uh, implementation phase, this slide may, might be a little too small to 
I hope you can see the, the, the details here. So you can see the number of projects proposed at the national level and at the regional level. And uh, the, for the implementation of these projects, we have selected three national, uh, three national demo projects and one regional uh, project for as a demo. So here we also indicate the process of selecting these projects. Uh, the projects are selected in the technical working groups that are represented from uh, the four main uh, sectoral ministries, Ministry of Energy, uh, Water, Agriculture, and we also included here Environment to make sure that uh, we are also ensuring sustainability of uh, used resources. And uh, let me go to the next slide showing you at least one example, which is a transboundary uh, project we, uh, which we have selected. That is uh, Tuyamuyun Hydropower Hydroelectric Complex. And it's a, uh, this represents a solid water and energy and food security case through, reason, uh, through seasonal regulation of the water volume in the, one of the two biggest rivers of the, of the region, of Central Asia region, Amudaria. It provides essential water and energy resources to agricultural farms for growing melons, guards, and other crops. Uh, wheat, cotton as well as to fish farms. So the facility also provides drinking water and electricity to the local population and private sector in the nearby areas in the territory of Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. However, the growing situation complicates effective water use of power generation and agricultural needs, which is a common challenge for all water bodies in Central Asia. So the demo project aims to find technical solution and investment opportunities to address the issue of intensive uh, siltation in this, uh, which is the case for all the Central Asian countries or, and uh, rivers in the region. So here is the uh, map where this uh, site is located. If you see this in the middle, there is one small dot. Uh, uh, so this was seven minutes so please yeah come to i me. have finished uh ah, so this okay. is the map of the uh, region uh, this is the map of the region from the uh, upper side we see uzbekistan and from the lower side we see turkmenistan and this is how this water reservation uh, reservoir could help the region uh, i have one more last slide uh, but i will maybe uh, just to give very brief explanation, this with this last slide, we wanted to say that we are open for cooperation and we would like to see uh, what kind of proposals could be made during this session to better promote this water and energy and food security, this nexus approach. So uh, any ideas on uh, joint cooperation in the region on institutionalizing the approach and utilizing the efforts would be welcome. Thank you. I, I think I won't go into the details of the game because that will be another seven minutes at least. Thank you very much, Alexander. No, thank you very much, Safa. Very interesting. And I think it was a good choice to start with the governance issue because in the end, we need to have a dialogue on the sector among the sectors and um, I think the following presentations will help to feed into the knowledge no, that is needed to to have that dialogue. And um, I know the GIZ project, we, we, we contributed with some learning materials to, to that project. And uh, I think it's really nice no, because it's, it promotes a regional dialogue about Nexus uh, issues and, and institutions and sectors. Any questions? To suffer. No.
Lars. If I can, if I don't know how to raise my hand here. Sorry. No, thank you very much. Not a question, but uh, really, uh, I would like to come back to you. Um, actually, um, Alexandra could say more about it. She coordinated a project we had under GIZ on the Nexus and other regions in the world. And I think joining forces would be great. Uh, if I think about this game, this could be something that is really interesting to think about developing it also for application in, in our master program. And we are currently developing a game on transboundary water cooperation. So I think exchange would be interesting. Of course, this goes to any other in this round, an invitation to yeah, join forces among the academic institutions as well. Thank you. Well, yes, thank you. I think uh, I'm, a, I'm very, uh, it's very pity that I didn't have enough time to uh, present the game itself, which was really interesting. That made a huge impact. And uh, taking any other chance, I would uh, be very glad to introduce the game, which, as I said, was very much welcome. And uh, yes, we would be also looking forward to joining the forces and learning from the new uh, new games that could be made available from our partners. Yeah. Maybe you can share a link or another document or documentation or website in the chat and then we can all you know, have it documented and can use it and have a look yeah okay let me let me find the link and i will share it uh, before the before the end of the session sure thank you very much so i don't know sebastian is he here now i don't think so so paul muñoz from ecuador Okay, hi to everyone. Let me know when I can start. Is it visible now? Yes. Okay, uh, hi, and now I invite you to discuss this study, which is entitled Remote Sensing and Machine Learning for Real Time Roma Forecasting in Large Complex Mountain Basins. This is an application for a hydro power optimization. Okay, so let me first share a few ideas on the relevance of the topic. Ecuador is a country in South America with an amazing potential for hydropower generation. So primordial national objective is to exploit and produce energy for internal consumption, as well as for becoming an energy exporter. So among the hydropower projects, uh, one of the most important in terms of energy generation is the Minas San Francisco plant. Uh, but now we know that producing hydropower energy relies on the amount of water energy, or water entering the plant, and that according to that volumes, the operating scheme and configuration of the plant is defined. So to have an idea of our motivation, let's picture this. There's, there's an extreme storm uh, in the basin and a huge volume of, of water is now approaching the plant. But if we don't know uh, 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 this, uh, if, if we don't forecast this approaching volume with sufficient time, the operators of the plant will not be able to exploit the full potential of energy generation. Or even the worst case, the approaching water volume can damage the functioning mechanisms of the plant. So I gave you two examples of why there's an urgent need to forecast and to optimize the function of the plant. Uh, but why optimization has not been done in the past? Well, this is because this demands a large amount of data uh, uh, currently in existence for the basin and demands the use of traditional hydrological models, which are generally complex. Uh, but let's focus on solutions, not, uh, not problems. A lot of relevant data can be overcome through the use of precipitation remote sensing products and the modeling difficulty can be somehow simplified by using machine learning techniques. So this is what we propose for the Mina San Francisco plant. We developed a real-time forecasting system for water volumes entering the plant uh, with the objective to communicate this information to plant operators so they can further optimize the energy uh, generation. Uh, about the methodology of the forecasting system, uh, everything starts with real-time data acquisition of precipitation satellite data from NASA. Uh, we also gather and store real-time runoff data from the plant. And once uh, this information is in our server, we process the data accordingly. For example, we perform uh, statistical analysis for creating the input data to the, to the models. Uh, and then we run the machine learning models that we specifically develop for the plant. All of the models are based on the random forest algorithm. Um, and finally, the last step of the system is to communicate uh, these forecasts to the operators of the plant. 
and, and this is done via email and all of this happens in real time so the operators know uh, the approaching volumes to the plant for the following 16 hours uh, with this slide i want to show you the overall performance of the forecasting system during the first semester uh, semester of operations uh, the figure at the top of the screen displays the observed runoff time series at the entrance of the plant in green, I have highlighted December, which is the month uh, with lower warm-up magnitudes forecast. In orange, uh, June with medium magnitudes. And in red, uh, July, when we face the highest uh, warm-up magnitudes to forecast. Uh, down below, you can, you can see three plots with a mutual agreement between observations and the forecast for the mentioned months. In the case of uh, low warm-up magnitudes, you can see that we obtain a more stable performance in terms of the correlation coefficient between observations and, and forecast. And then as runoff magnitude increases or become more extreme, we experience more difficulty in forecasting future runoff, especially for lead times higher than eight hours. Um, moreover, I'm mentioning here the three main sources of error that we face. Uh, the first one arises from satellite data when precipitation information does not represent the real conditions of the basin. The second error, uh, error is related to the monitoring of runoff in the plant. Uh, the error depends on the device used for measuring runoff and also issues related to delayed transmission of the data to our server. And finally, the last error is due to, to, model is, to modeling issues proper of the random forest algorithm, which, which we know is not robust for extreme runoff uh, without prior strategies for improving the learning process. So we expect to do this in the future when we have uh, additional data for, for training our, our models. Um, I don't see my presentation. Me neither. I uh, know it's back. Now it's back. Yes. Is it visible now? Yes. Okay. So I, I was about to, to finish. Uh, so to end up this presentation, let me put on the table some scientific and operational, operational remarks. Uh, scientific remarks are, for instance, the fact that the, uh, the forecasting models that, uh, that we developed were successfully developed with only two years of data. We know that with the addition of new data, we can improve our forecasting models. We are also aware that the extreme runoff events are difficult to forecast, and thus we need to develop specialized models for that. Uh, we also know that the Minas San Francisco entity is about to equip the basin with ground precipitation stations. So once available, this additional information will be, of course, added to our models, and this will imply uh, improvement in model efficiencies and forecast. Uh, regarding operational remarks, uh, we are proud of having set a clear bridge between science and decision makers. This is something we were missing, the connection for applying the knowledge we are generating, uh, generating in academia. So we hope this application opens the path for future uh, work with decision, maker, decision, decision makers and politicians. And finally, uh, the presented uh, work can be replicated in other hydro power plants or water systems in Ecuador and the region. Uh, so this is what I wanted to show you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. And greetings to Rolando as well. Um, does anybody have a question related to the forecasting? And yes, if you have questions, you can also put them into the chat, especially the participants. But it would be also nice if the other speakers would have a question, especially those who work with hydropower as well. No question. <laughs> well, I think this is an extremely important topic now because in countries where energy security or electricity security has been high, uh, there are new challenges now because of longer drought, drought, drought or dry periods. And therefore, it's very important to have a new methods to plan and to forecast such oh it was yeah such uh, such events lars lars is question something thank you no very interesting presentation I, I would have many questions but perhaps to this last slide you said communication started in may last year so what is your experience what was the feedback from the users or from their let's say did they really uh, appreciate it or did they make recommendations to improve it did they use it so that would be this user experience would be interesting to hear 
<clears throat> okay, so uh, so um, so the plant, the Minas San Francisco entity, is obligated to to provide forecast uh, to the to a national entity. So they need to to schedule the the energy generation for the following days. So they were doing this in the past without forecasting, or, or with uh, very rough forecasting. So now they get they get a daily forecast uh, updated uh, three times uh, three times per day. So they now uh, can uh, uh, um, properly uh, schedule the energy generation. So they are, uh, we know they are very happy. I, I know we have some issues with the transmission of the data, especially from, from the plant. I was mentioning that runoff data, uh, we, we gathered this data from them. So sometimes it, it is difficult for us. We have technical issues, but then we provide a forecast every day. So we also provide a measure of, of, of uh, uncertainty so they know uh, how sure they can be about the forecast that we provide. Okay, I think the question from Simon is, is answered with that uh, answer. So I would like to, uh, uh, Stefano Galegi is asking if there's a chance to use other satellite products for longer lead times. Yes, in this application, we're using the IMEC product from us. But we are also testing the Persian, for instance, which has a, a better spatial and temporal resolution. So we are in, the, in, in this uh, in this moment we're investigating that we're trying to, to merge uh, some uh, satellite data with fusion techniques, for for, for example. And uh, yes, this is this is work uh, that we are doing now. Excellent. Yeah, there's a lot of development also in this field. Jorge Leon, what about replacing random forest with recurrent neural networks? Since this is time series data we are dealing with. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, Jorge. Uh, uh, we have tested the random forest algorithm very widely. I mean, we, we have done a lot of investigation in this algorithm. And we know that uh, this works for at least a uh, mean uh, run up in the, in the basin. Uh, the problem with uh, uh, recurring real neural networks, such as uh, long short term memory, uh, is that we only have two years of data. So we are applying this uh, this uh, method in other uh, basins or catchments where we have more data. But here we're limited by, 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 by the time frame of the data. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. A lot of Room for development. You have the contact of Paul and group now. And uh, yeah, thank you uh, very much. So we continue now with the next speaker. Thank you. Who is Abbas Alomari about um, energy demand in water supply for the capital of Jordan, Amman? Should I share it? Uh, yes, please. Professor? Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, everybody. So I'm going to talk about the energy uh, required for the Amman water uh, supply. I will first talk about some information about the energy sector in uh, Jordan and also uh, the water sector. So Jordan is among uh, the poorest countries in the world in terms of water resources. Now it is classified as the second poorest country in terms of water uh, resources. Now, what complicates the, the water resources problem in Jordan is that it is uh, coupled with uh, also the fact that Jordan is also uh, poor in energy resources. Jordan, Jordan almost imports all of its energy needs. Now, in 2017, Jordan imports about 94% of its energy need in terms of uh, oil and gas. The 6%, this was produced by... Uh, renewable energy, solar energy mainly, and also oil shale. Uh, the rest is uh, imported. Now, Jordan's energy, Jordan energy demand is about 17,672 gigawatt hour per uh, year. These numbers, all the numbers are for uh, 2017. Now, uh, the water sector in Jordan uses about 15% 
of uh, the energy demand of the whole country, which is about one sixth of the energy demand for uh, Jordan, which is actually uh, too high. Uh, now, uh, uh, Amman uh, is the capital of Jordan, where about 42% of Jordanians live in Amman uh, city. So this uh, causes also, uh, we will see now the energy demand for Amman, uh, for the water sector only, is also too, uh, too high. So the objective is to investigate the energy demand for supplying water to Amman city and identify associated risks and opportunities. <clears throat> now, water resources to Amman, uh, the methods, so a collection of uh, data, identification of water resources to Amman, and collection of published pertinent data about water and energy, Collection of published data on energy use for Amman water supply, including pumping, uh, treatment, distribution, and also wastewater collection and uh, treatment. Now, where data is not available, so the energy was calculated from the basic uh, equation. Then determine, determination of the specific energy, which is energy per cubic meter of water used, and identification of high energy demand sources and making uh, recommendations. <clears throat> so Amman receives water from about uh, six or seven sources. So the main sources are the DC, the DC water, and the second one is the King Abdullah Canal water, and the third main source is the Zara uh, Springs, or Zaria, Zara Ma'in Springs. And the other sources are uh, small, they contribute only small proportion to Amman water supply. So uh, the, uh, the DC project, yeah, the DC water supply and uh, supplies about 41% of Amman, what, in Amman uh, water need and the uh, Zara Ma'in and King Abdullah Canal, they supply about 45% of Amman, uh, of the need for Amman. So both DC, uh, Zara Ma'in and King Abdullah Canal, they supply about 85% of uh, the water demand for Amman city. Now the problem of these three resources, now the DC uh, project uh, or as, as a resource, it's about 350 kilometers south of Amman. So there's a lot of energy uh, consumed or needed to pump the water from the source to Amman. And the other two sources, King Abdullah Canal and Zara Ma'in, they are, uh, they are in the Jordan Valley where there is about 1,300 uh, meter elevation difference between these, uh, these two sources and Amman. And that's what causes uh, the energy demand for the water supply to be too high. So this is, uh, this figure shows the energy for pumping and the treatment for Amman for, 90, for 20, 2017. So we see the, the three sources, the DC and um, uh, King Abdullah Canal and also the Zara Ma'in source. So these three sources, uh, we see that the DC, uh, the DC uh, consumes about 51% of the uh, energy demand for Amman or for the water supply to Amman. And King Abdullah Khair is about 29 and uh, Zara Ma'in is about 18%. So this is about, uh, yeah, we have 51, about 80, about 98% of the energy consumed in the water sector for Amman is to uh, is used by these three uh, sources. So this shows the uh, specific energy, that's the energy per uh, one meter uh, cube of water. So for the DC project, it's about 6.5. For the uh, King Abdullah Canal, it's about four, and also for Zara Ma'in, it's about almost five. For how it's high, but the the quantity is uh, for how and also Wala was it's yeah for how it's high, but the quantity brought from how is not uh, it's about three hundred thousand cubic meter. So the the specific energy for these three sources is high compared to the other uh, sources. Uh, this is mainly because of the pumping, uh, pumping the water against uh, the high elevation in King Abdullah Canal and Zara Ma'in, 
and also because uh, pump, pump of uh, pumping the water from south of Jordan for about uh, 325 kilometers. Yeah, this is uh, this is the energy for treatment or for distribution. The, so the other, the, the, what was covered so far was energy demand for pumping and the treatment. So this is the energy demand for distribution. So Amman, there are about, mainly about six zones in Amman where water is distributed to the different uh, parts of Amman. And we see that the uh, energy uh, consumed in distribution compared to that for pumping is too uh, little. We can see here, this access the uh, specific energy for pumping. It is, it is less than that one. The highest is 0.8, while for, for treatment, uh, for distribution, while we see for uh, pumping, it was in terms of five and six. So most of the energy used in Amman water supply is uh, consumed for pumping. So energy consumed by the water sector in Amman is high due to the high pumping uh, demand and also long distance between the source uh, and uh, Amman city. Uh, these tools are correct for yeah for King Abdullah Canal Zara Ma'in and the DC water. So energy needed for pumping is uh, makes the real share of the energy for the water sector. So the solution or what can be done uh, is to improve pumping efficiency, and also is to try to use or to move to uh, renewable resources, especially the hydro, uh, the hydro power. Whether so there are some opportunities where hydropower can be used to reduce dependence on uh, fuel. Now for, for Jordan, now our our option for uh, to, to improve water supply to Amman and to Jordan is uh, in, the, in uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, which is still uh, too far from Amman, which is about 400 kilometers of Amman. So other, the other resources also are still, uh, are also high or are far from Amman and they will also need uh, a lot of uh, or uh, considerable amounts of energy to pump to Amman city. So in terms of energy, our uh, our options are, uh, is to improve pumping efficiency and maybe also to 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 maintain the pipes, the mains, because old pipes also can cause a lot, consume a lot of energy and also to move to renewables, uh, especially uh, hydropower. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Al Amari Omari. Does anybody have questions? Lars, do you have a question? But only if no others have questions. Uh, thank you, Abbas. Uh, yeah. We already were in the, in the carousel meeting each other this morning. So yeah. it's the same time we can talk. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, just quick questions. You, you mentioned hydropower is an option, but the hydropower potential in Jordan is very low. So could you elaborate? Yes, on that? It, can, it can, you know, uh, for, example, for example, for the wastewater treatment. For Asamra, now they are producing 90% uh, of the Asamra uh, demand for power from hydropower. They placed a, a, a turbine at the inlet and a turbine at the outlet, and they are producing about, and also in addition to biogas. So they are producing uh, about 90% of the energy demand for Asamra. So there are, there are some opportunities where you can uh, substitute uh hydropower uh substitute uh traditional power sources so in wastewater treatment treatment plants they can they can all i think uh generate their uh energy demand by simply placing uh, uh turbines and also in desalination plants because also desalination consume, consumes a lot of energy so also in desalination plants because the 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 brine is this is disposed at uh at high pressure. So this pressure can be used uh, to run a turbine and produce uh, some hydropower. And there are also some dams. 
So yeah, there are some opportunities uh, that can be uh, implemented uh, to to produce some hydropower uh, to support the uh, water sector. Thank and there you are also, much. of course, there are wind energy and also solar energy. I think so too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Especially decentralized systems no? using solar energy in agriculture systems. Yeah. Instead of pumping with grid electricity. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I okay. saw Sebastian. So we, we keep in touch. No? I will write an email and I hope. We can discuss in more detail. Um, yeah. uh, Sebastian, I see him now in the group, but he has not managed to upload or to send a PDF. So it's difficult. Maybe you can just um, give some oral um, sharing. Some uh, explanations about your work in Argentina and, and how you increase water use efficiency and decrease energy demand. Sebastian? Well, I, he doesn't respond. But you might have seen his presentation. I think he sent it to all of us. So if you are interested in this work, you could get in touch with him. Um, okay, uh, I, but we still are well, we need to proceed last, no? just save the question and we can discuss this in a later step. Um, so now I would like to invite Elisa Bardazzi to present her view or her review and uh, about computable general equilibrium models. Hi. I personally have never tried, <laughs> but I'm very curious about it. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. So I'm very glad to be here today presenting the results of my literature review about the water food energy nexus and how it is assessed on with economical models and more specifically with computable general equilibriums. So, um, well, I think everyone in this session knows about the concept of Nexus, so I will not spend time in addressing the complexity and the structure of this issue. Nevertheless, I feel the need to stress how uh, precise because of its complexity and the inherent structure, um, this topic is addressed with several methodologies of different kind uh, in the literature. Uh, in particular, there are uh, several different scales, uh, uh, different precision and aggregation uh, between the um, pieces and the sectors, uh, which, oh, wait, somebody's changing the slide. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, for example, um, so th this is an issue, the different methods uh, uh, with which we can assess the nexus is of course an issue. And um, as, for example, stated by, Z by Zhang and others in their paper of 2018, uh, they can all be fit to address the nexus, uh, uh, but the um, feasibility and the efficiency of uh, these different methodologies depends on the priorities, on the scale and the level of precision the researchers want to address. So for my research as an economist, I decided to focus on a specific type of model uh, with our CGEs, Computable General Equilibrium. I am aware that the literature on this instrument itself states that there are several shortcomings uh, which are uh, stated in the right side of the slides. Uh, nevertheless, I'm yes. so sorry to interrupt you, but maybe you could just explain what it does. So, because for me, it's absolutely not clear. Okay, yes. Also because so, you mentioned agent based models. So, no, what is the difference or comparison? Okay, so yes, for sure. Uh, CGEs are um, are model of the whole economic. So there are all the sectors from agriculture, energy, then it depends on the disaggregation of the specific model, but in general, it covers 
the full economy so you have a, like all the sectors all the agents in the economics so usually um there are three main uh, uh, agents so that are the industries that sell products uh, to households and the governments the governments that buy uh, products uh, from the industries and supply uh, let's say some some common goods uh, to the households and the households that that uh, mm, give some money to the governments and uh, uh, gives labor to the industries and also that buy from the industry directly some of the goods so it's um very very simple uh, uh, over overview of the general economics the thing that is uh, useful is that uh, uh, then it's in an, in, in an equilibrium it's part of the name so demand and supply uh, should be in equilibrium and then you can of course uh, uh, disalign demand and supply so it it, it means it mainly comes out as an instrument uh, to study the effects of uh, shocks uh, or of policies. So the, um, the main aim of this type of model is what happens if uh, I change one single variable. For example, I have a huge uh, shock in uh, agricultural productivity. I change my, the, the, the productivity of the agricultural sector and I see which are uh, the main economic effects, uh, both uh, uh for the agents or for the government for example for the consumption or for their uh, income in general or at the macroeconomic macroeconomic effects uh, so for example import import export uh, the balance of trade uh, dependency and gdp so it's uh it's not uh, um so i'm, I'm gonna so of course there are, there are some limitations that i explained on the right uh, it mo it mostly is uh, about uh, well the fact for example that is uh, there is only a uh, rational agent uh, or that of course uh, the economy uh, needs to be in equilibrium because it, it simplifies how we see the shocks but of course an economics is never in equilibrium in real life so of course it's a simplification but it can be useful and i think uh yes in Okay, no, not in this slide, but I think it, it's useful for the nexus because it's it mainly it's made uh, to see the interconnections between sectors and how productivity or prices change can affect uh, the trade between countries and between sectors of uh, uh, intermediate inputs, and um, it can address the use of primary inputs. Uh, um, uh, between different sectors, so that there's actually uh, that that's an issue that can be interesting to be seen uh, in a nexus uh, in a nexus framework for example my uh, i'll explain why my main uh, my main objective of my phd i'm doing a phd is to address water uh, sector uh, so so how the water is uh, uh, assigned between different sectors because that's so water uh, our water scarcity and competition for water resources can affect productivity of the other two sectors of the nexus so agriculture and energy mainly so this competition between sectors is exactly what i want to address and uh, i can't see my slide anymore what i don't know yes. what happened. Um, put them back okay so oh okay so what um what was my result in doing the the literature um of course there are I mean, I already explained CGs have some shortcomings, uh, for example, lack of data, or uh, usually they refer to a nearly uh, base, uh, time base. So, for example, hourly data for precipitation or runoff uh, that are maybe monthly data, for example, are difficult to be aggregated into the as an input of the CGs. So that's a problem, usually. The, but I also found a specific lack, uh, a structural lack for these models. That is, usually the CGs in the literature, uh, let's say, uh, consider water as an endowment only if uh, specifically addressing the water food link and specifically for agriculture. So there is in the literature a lot of works uh, discussing the. 
the water agricultural nexus very well and they explicitly refer to water but if we see uh, the other links of the water food energy nexus so water food for the other sectors or water energy or energy food uh, there are only three papers in the whole literature of course um, with specific keywords etc but i find only three papers suitable to discuss it in general and then there are some uh, shortcomings in the aggregation of the sectors uh, etc so that they're not actually perfect even the, the few of them that are present in the literature uh, have specific lacks so my conclusion is uh, that the introduction of the water endowment systematically in the in the cgs uh, it's uh, very important especially for what concerns the energy sector uh, that is not dealt with uh, in the literature and it would be critical for the macroeconomic assessment overall and of the specific sector of the nexus so it should be a priority for this research field um, so i will i will not take uh, um, time anymore but if you have any question you can ask me now or i actually i put here uh, my email or my page at the cmc in venice italy and uh, of course, I will be glad to answer some of the questions in the Q&A uh, time right now. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you so much, Elisa. Very interesting. I think we need no more approaches that integrate the resources and economics and social mm -hmm. economics. Does anybody have questions? No. Well, I will have a, a, a closer look at the equations, no? but I, I suppose that you, these are time series, no? because some of the variables you, you mentioned are like static, no? like GDP or so, what are, yeah. So, but I, I don't know if we have the time now to discuss this in detail, but I would be interested how it actually works in the equation or in the... Yeah, I mean, for sure, we... I, I can explain uh, my work or uh, discuss it uh, you know, in a separate uh, side, uh, for sure. Mm. Well, I'm looking forward to your review. I suppose that you want to publish it and then will be available. Yeah, I'm trying. It's, it's submitted, so it's, uh, I hope it's going to be available soon. Ah, perfect. Very interesting. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. So the problem is now that Sebastian is, uh, has appeared, but the problem, I have already given more minutes to the other speakers because I wasn't expecting him back. So I would like to first then um, continue with um, um, Stefano Galelli, Galelli, Galelli. Yes, uh, that's correct. About regional droughts. Uh, in Chao Praia and Mekong and how they somehow interact in terms of hydropower generation. Mm. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, can you see the screen? Yes. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm an associate professor in Singapore at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. We broadly work in the area, as you might imagine, of course, of the food, water, and the energy nexus. And what we're going to do in the next uh, five minutes or so is to go through a very brief overview of the relationship between electricity supply, water availability, and in particular droughts, and climate variability in the Greater Mekong subregion. So let's start by introducing the key characters. Now, if we're talking about electricity supply in the Greater Mekong subregion, and in particular Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, one of the key characters to consider is Laos. Why is that? Well, Laos doesn't have a large electricity demand, but does have a large hydropower potential, part of which, or a fair fraction of which, has already been uh, developed. But importantly, most of, his, uh, of this hydropower production is exported to nearby countries, and in particular to, to Thailand. So as you can see here on the left, about 80% of Laos installed capacity is actually the disposal of the Thai power system. So here in this map, you can see essentially the, the extent of the Thai power supply grid and its uh, long distance transfer or connections with the Laotian grid. 
Now, the other main characters that we have to consider in this story, if we want to look at the entire uh, relation between water, energy, and climate, are the river basins. So now, uh, one obviously is the Mekong River Basin, flowing all the way from China to uh, the Delta in Vietnam. But the other fundamental component to consider here is the Chao Phraya. Why? Because uh, the water of both the Chao Phraya and the Mekong are used not only for hydropower supply, but for uh, cooling the thermal power stations, so primarily gas and coal thermoelectric stations. And while we know a lot about uh, hydropower and the externalities that it has on the environment and the many debates that we have on the environmental impact of these dams, what we don't really know is actually the role that these dams play within the power system. So in other words, what we're going to see very briefly today is uh, in somewhat a provocative fashion is the question, can actually these hydropower um, dams keep the promise of clean electricity supply? How do they perform? So for example, when there is a drought, what happens? You might expect, as you're going to see later, that as hydropower reliability decreases um, during droughts, the system will have to increase uh, the reliance on uh, coal and gas. Now, how do we answer this question? Ideally, we should use high resolution data, which for the region are really uh, not available. So very briefly on this part, we use a specially distributed high resolution coupled water and energy model. The power system behavior is uh, simulated with hourly resolution uh, using a power system model developed um, in my group. The name of this model is Pownet is essentially a production cost model that simulates the amount of electricity supplied by each different source, as well as the amount of electricity that flows through the grid. Inputs are many. It took a lot of time to set up the model for, uh, for a large region. It ranges from the characteristics of the power plants, of the coal plants, uh, of course, the demand of the different nodes, the availability of renewables, and very, 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 of course, important for the region is the availability of hydropower supply. Now, how do we simulate that? That is where, of course, water comes in. We use a specially distributed hydrological uh, model. One is implemented for the Chao Praia in Thailand. The other one is implementing for the Mekong. And the fundamental thing here is that we simulate the dynamics of all main hydropower reservoirs within the basin. Now, with a model like this, we can, for example, run 20 years of hydrology and see how the power system responds to varying hydrological conditions. So you have an example here. This plot is a little bit busy, so let me try to navigate you quickly. What do we have here? Uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the uh, standardized drought index in the Mekong, briefly, negative values, droughts, positive values, wet periods. On the vertical axis, you have the uh, droughts in the Chao Phraya, again, negative and positive. So when we are here, it means that both rivers are in dry conditions. And the color here is simply telling us the deviation or anomalies of available hydropower with respect to the long-term mean. So what you can see is that there are years like 1977 or 1983 like hydrological conditions in which we have a massive decrease in the order of 4,000 gigawatt hour in a year of available hydropower. And this happens when both rivers are in dry conditions or when the Mekong is in dry conditions. Now, what's the consequence? Well, the system has to rely more on uh, gas and coal to meet the electricity demands. So, Dry conditions essentially have a cost in the order of $150 million per year in terms of production costs of electricity. And of course, because it's necessary to rely more on um, gas and coal, we observe a corresponding increase in CO2 emissions in the order of 2 2.5 million tons per year. Now, the question is, how often does this happen and why does it happen? Well, the culprit, one of the culprits, if you like, is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So it's a climate phenomenon that happens with a return period of about five uh, to seven years. There are two um, oscillations or components to end. So one is in are the El Nino events, the other one are the La Nina events. And El Nino conditions in Southeast Asia tend, are, tend to be associated to drier conditions, which we uh, tend again to be related to higher costs and higher CO2 emissions. So to so wrap up, the main overarching conclusion essentially is that the hydropower reservoirs in Laos and in the region in general are vulnerable to hydroclimatic uh, variability. When this happens, we notice a very large decrease in hydropower production. And in response to that, we don't really observe 
blackouts, meaning that the install capacity is sufficient to meet electricity demand, but we do observe a large increase in production cost um, and CO2 emissions. So this was a very brief overview. Uh, here you have the reference to the main um, articles we published, and all software we developed for the region is available online. So you can have, you can see here the uh, link to the GitHub uh, repository. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Does anybody have a question? Well, I have several questions. <laughs> sure, please, please. Yeah. So my first one would be, well, um, well, I'm a hydrologist, so I work a lot with climate phenomena and of course with um, mm -hmm. hydrology and um, and often people mention the Enso phenomenon uh, in mm -hmm. the context of uh, droughts and so on, but how exactly would you use that information? I mean, not that there, there are several papers about the relationship between droughts and or between sure. climate or um, extremes and the Enso phenomenon. And so how would you use it in the context of hydropower? In the future, well, this finding. Mm. Sure. Well, the fundamental thing is that you do expect the signature of ENSO on hydropower availability. And that's pretty obvious because it's related to, to water availability, right? What you don't necessarily expect is the signature of ENSO on CO2 emissions and production costs. Because normally a power system is designed to buffer hydrological variability. So in this case, it's not, happen it's not happening. So how do you use it then? I think the it's bad news, obviously, right? It means that the system is not really robust with respect to hydroclimatic variability. But the good news is that ENSO is, happens of, over a fairly long uh, seasonal, if you like, time scale. So it's predictable. There are plenty of, of, of products with, which contain information on how the next it's season will look like. So there's a lot of actually information you can leverage in order to take actions, right? Actions could be from reoperating other power reservoirs for that reason to even buy power futures. You can buy uh, an insurance, for example, uh, mm. if, you are power, if you are a power operator with respect to a given condition, you can try to decrease electricity demand for the coming season. So there are a lot of different uh, knobs, if you like, that, that can be used once that information is, um, is available. Yes, thank you. Does anybody have another question? <laughs> Jorge Leon, is it possible that the cost and CO2 emission from hydropower performance drop in some years, like in the case of wind and solar? Uh, cost and CO2 emissions from hydropower performance drop. So we can make the case. Um, Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. So okay, yeah. I think solar and, and, and wind don't really need, they don't need anything else to be made a case of. But uh, I think that the key player here would be that there's a lot of hydropower you can use for as a battery, essentially. So if the region will decide, and Thailand has given clear sign that they are planning to increase the amount of solar PV installed, if that's going to happen, then you do need to store essentially wind and solar production in excess and uh, hydropower production still happens to be the cheapest kind of battery in a way, right? That can be used for, uh, for that task. So yes. So I have one more question. So how did you calculate the SDI, I suppose with the VCI model or? Uh, yes, yes. So we have the, the VIC model. The SDI was showing there is aggregated across uh, the river okay. basin. So it's it's very it's simply mm -hmm. the spatial average, but you can you can actually because the model is is spatially distributed, you can actually calculate it for the computational grid of interest. Yeah, because I think the upstream part with snow and uh, from China yeah, is yeah, of most important to see water availability. Yeah. No, but a detail. I believe that you you use a good one. And then I, the hourly resolution, of course, makes me curious as well. But I will I will read the papers and then <laughs> come back to you. Sure. Yeah. I'm more than happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I will leave the floor 
to Sebastian. I hope I Felix or Sebastian. He will let us know. Felix, Sebastian. Gone again. Ah, I think he has a bad connection. Yeah, hello. It's Marina from the background to take support. <laughs> hello. Mm. Uh, he's Hi. in the room. Uh, as he's the last speaker, maybe let's give him a, a chance to reconnect. Of course. Uh, we, as when the, the coordinator of the conference, he, he allowed me more time <laughs> because That's, there's no other activity afterwards. So, so no problem if he's there. <laughs> great. Hello. But, uh, yeah. Hello, Sebastian. All right, we cannot hear you yet. All right. Okay, can you say something, please? We cannot hear you. I think um, the, the connection is very bad. Yeah, all right. I think, yeah, the connection is quite bad, but maybe we can improve it. Just turn off the camera and only go for the audio. So just turn on the mic and you see that the mic is turned on when there appears a green dot next to it. Maybe let me know in the chat if you can uh, understand me and if there is a green dot next to your mic, next to the icon of the microphone, of course. You see my screen now, is that correct? Uh, we can hear no. you now, we can hear you now, but we cannot see your screen yet. Okay, so leave off the camera. That should improve your your um, your connection. All right. So, and you have already tried to screen share. Uh, it's coming up. Yes. It is. Okay. Um, yeah. My apologies for all the colleagues. I just got the login um, as soon as the bit later the the session started, uh, and it's awful at this time of the day. Okay, as so, we have another seven minutes. If you give me the green light, then I will just go ahead and quickly present the my results. I think you have the green light. Go on. Shall I present? The, yes, please. Fast. Have you seen my screen already? Yeah, we have. We have. Only in a few minutes left. <laughs> Great. Okay, I'm reading you. So I'll just um, go ahead with the presentation. Okay, so basically, um, we're talking about Mendoza. This is a semi arid area in Western Argentina where water is key for economic development. And this is a very agro-industrialized uh, area where only agriculture takes a, few, a little bit less than 10 points of the GDP. But among the region, 40% are relying basically on groundwater resources. There's an ongoing water scarcity that uh, this has been beyond a decade, which increased pressure in the aquifers, and simultaneously, the aquifers, I mean, groundwater is being used as an alternative water resource, or should be like a supplementary water resource, and simultaneously, the energy price is being subsidized. So that increased the demand substantially. There was, um, since then, main infrastructure, Win situation on not only water or ensuring enough water to manage for agricultural agro industries use, but also to diminish the energy the energy cost for some farmers. And this was a Villegas La Pampa project oriented to promote and protect the natural conditions by simultaneously modernizing an efficient irrigation system. So this was a mixed scheme, basically. Um, Infil diminished infiltration in the upstream canals and improving the pressurization of the down downstream system. We are talking about 26 kilometers of waterproof conductions. Among those, 
12.4 of pressure pipes and the construction of the reservoir beyond uh, 60,000 cubic meters. The interesting part of this it will be the demand irrigation scheme, which is basically the usage of pressurized water according to the crop irrigation needs without the traditional administration administration uh, participation and authorities. The project uh, had several um, different areas of influence, but I will just avoid this just to focus on a quickly picture area. So number one was the, the clear beneficial or the straight benefit beneficiaries of the project since they have the infrastructure areas and at the this zone uh, one is where the main agro-industries agro have been developed, in particular wine grape for high priced wines. But simultaneously, there were some streams happening. So the water has not been used in this area, will later come out in this area that will be southwest from the, from the research area. We're talking about difference between 10 and 15 kilometers. All the blue and green dots are wine grape production from different districts, and the red dots are pump production. All for agro industries, you can see some bigger concentration, and that comes with a greater vineyards being settled in this area. So one of the main objectives was, or the secondary but became a greater objective, was the decrease in energy pumping that I said that was, uh, it is still heavily subsidized. This is a graph containing the brief summarization of 20 years of energy, um, of electricity used for pumping water. And since the project um, had con uh, effects on the averages, or I mean, the, the project diminished the energy pumping and therefore the levels of energy pump diminished to 60% uh, of the historical values, but January, February, and June and July, which are critical for the wine grape production on alternative crops, diminished substantially by less than 20% on a 20 year average. So now currently less than 2000 hectares nearly stopped pumping water, and uh, as I mentioned, the demand decreased 20% of historical level. This is uh, nothing more than it creates greater availability of water resource for crop demand. There's aquifer relief and the diminish of the energy demanded. This has comes along with an efficiency gains in water management and basically or more important responsible development of um, agriculture areas in the future. I, I sincerely hope that you were able to hear my presentation. And once again, my apologies for all this delay. Yes, thank you very much. It was clear and uh, very interesting. Also complementary to the other presentations. I think this was a, uh, we had a large variety of different approaches and solutions how we can tackle uh, the lack of integration of uh, resources management. So no more time to talk, but I hope we keep all in touch and somehow can repeat this maybe in another conference soon. Um, it was very interesting. I think we all will have the recordings and um, the PowerPoints or the PDFs where we find the email addresses of the speakers. So thank you very much and hope to see you again.